Um, I think a better title for today's talk would have perhaps been uh, the economic and financial dimensions of hybrid warfare. And in that regard, uh, if you think about the various policy tools we have available to us, there's not a lot of room uh, between words, read diplomacy, and military action. I mean, if you think about what's in between, you've got, you've got a number of things going on there, but economic and financial sanctions are oftentimes a go-to option because they're non-kinetic, uh, they, they can be effective, and, um, and you don't have all kinds of alternatives. You have espionage, uh, you have cyber, uh, it's not to say that it's the only set of tools, but I would say it's the prominent one. And that's why you see folks thinking, you know, sanctions uh, pretty quickly. Um, don't worry about this right now. We'll get back to that. Uh, but in any event, uh, obviously economic and financial warfare has been around for millennia. So there's nothing new there. Uh, it started with sieges, embargoes, I mean, you know the list. But in the, uh, in the past, say, 35 years, there has been a particularly important transition uh, in the economic and financial domain, as we call it. It used to be fairly simple that, you know, financing vehicles, for example, were just commercial banks and governments. Now you have the securities markets, stocks, bonds, and a, a whole range of other sophisticated ways to, to raise money. Uh, we're thinking about potential adversaries now, not just uh, ourselves and, and uh, friendly allies, but uh, how do bad guys, bad actors, fund themselves in their global predations? And if we are able to determine those funding me mechanisms, uh, we have a much better handle on what our options are uh, to complicate their lives or to deliver some debilitating blows. And in that regard, I thought that we could do a little bit of then and now, going back to the Soviet period and some of the rather stunning revelations that we had in this very connection at the beginning of, the, well, the late 1970s, beginning of the 80s, and how myself, and uh, in particular, was, was able to have the good fortune to take some of these ideas and actually implement them uh, at the White House with, uh, with Ronald Reagan as president, who had always believed that the Soviet economy was unsustainable because it was an administered command economy that wasn't operating on the basis of market forces. It didn't have entrepreneurship, and it wasn't cultivating uh, innovation and technology leaps. Uh, with, they were, the Soviets were typically stealing our technology and reverse engineering, and very quickly and effectively. But that's a whole different thing than learning how to get to that next generation of technology. This is still, obviously, a major problem for them. So. Uh, he had, uh, had the view that it was a matter of time before the Soviets, in effect, ran out of gas for this very reason. And, um, but he had never had numbers and never had an analytical rationale to, to justify that instinct. And I think that that's where uh, my background as an, as an East-West banker uh, proved helpful. And to take you back just quickly, uh, and we can get into the, uh, the current iterations of all of this later. Uh, when I was a lad uh, at Chase Manhattan Bank, um, I, was, uh, I had done my master's in the economies of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And uh, it was the flowering of detente one when we were experimenting with the notion of Nixon and Kissinger that expanded geo, geo, I mean, expanded commercial relationships and east-west trade would inevitably result in greater geopolitical cooperation and an impulse for democratic pluralism. We hear the same old saw with the Chinese. 
and of course with the Soviets and the Chinese, never happened to this day. But nevertheless, it was an experiment then, and I, for one, was prepared to give it a go. And uh, Chase Manhattan Bank was the leading bank in the United States at the time, just like J.P. Morgan Chase is today. And uh, with David Rockefeller at the helm, who was the leading business statesman in the world, and of course the scion of the greatest industrial empire arguably in the history of man, Standard Oil, uh, the Soviets had a, an abiding respect for Rockefeller. They, they looked at it as presidents come and go every four years, uh, Rockefeller remains. So they had, they looked up to him ironically, even though he was the pinnacle of the capitalist enemy that they were supposedly dedicated to defeating. So Chase enjoyed a very uh, early and uh, prominent relationship with the Soviets and was the first American bank to open a representative there, office there in, in 1973, uh, when all of this was really, in, again, full flower. <clears throat> so uh, when I joined Chase uh, and went through the executive training program and all of this and did a stint in Tokyo, I ended up in the Soviet East European Division of the bank. And I went through the ranks and became vice president division executive in charge of, of that portfolio and all of our loans there. And that included Yugoslavia for an odd reason, but uh, it was that entire region, including the Balkans. And one of the things that came to my attention that was a lasting lesson, and something for you to keep in mind because you're still seeing it today, is, uh, is how bad actors, much like disinformation, much like you know, the, the cyber realm, uh, how deceptive they can be uh, in terms of the way they attract Western financing. Uh, now, at the time, they had uh, some, a project that was one of the largest in Soviet history called the Orenburg Gas Pipeline, which was a 1,700-mile pipeline from the oil fields in the Caucasus into the West European gas grid. It was about a $2.2 billion deal, which was huge in the late 70s. And... Um, it doesn't sound like much now, but believe me, it was big money then. And uh, it was done in four loans with uh, syndicated loans, as they were called, where banks get together to produce, you know, a loan of the size, say, of $600 million, which was a lot of banks required, surprisingly, to get that kind of money. And, uh, and it was ostensibly to be used for the purchase of oil and gas equipment, uh, the pipe itself from Manusmann in Germany, uh, compressor stations, turbines, you know, everything you need to build the thing. So it was a project loan, or at least was advertised as being a project loan. Um, I discovered along the trail that, in fact, uh, this was a fraud, that the Soviets were actually paying for all of that equipment that I just mentioned in gas deliveries to Germany and France and elsewhere in Europe that the Europeans knew that they were being paid in cash, I mean in, in gas, but nevertheless played the game that the loans were required for these same purchases. So you had a $2.2 billion double financed deal. And more troubling was the fact that in legal agreements, uh, the Europeans who knew better were prepared to allow the Soviets to get a better interest rate because a project loan gets a better interest rate than a no-purpose cash loan uh, because it has the ability to repay itself and so forth. And, and so this was a big advantage to Moscow. A few percentage points is, uh, is a lot of money when you're talking about billions. So uh, not only did we see a massive double financing that ultimately we tracked into the takeover of Angola, they used that discretionary cash for a malevolent purpose in this case, but again, as troubling was the fact that the Germans in particular, Deutsche Bank and Dresdner Bank, knew. And when I approached Chase and said, look, we need to go to Deutsche Bank and tell them that we understand that this is a fraudulent double finance deal, initially Chase said okay and they sent in uh, a guy from our London office to meet with Deutscher 
and they told him the story. And Deutsche Bank said, if, you, if we ever hear this story again, we're going to be forced to sever our entire relationship with Chase. So you have the largest bank in Germany warning us that if we ever told this story again, that it was going to cost us what was at the time the most prominent banking relationship in the West. So when you talk about straying into sensitive territory unwittingly, try that on for size. And more importantly, coming down the pike a year or two later was a, another pipeline project that became known as the Siberian Gas Pipeline Project that was well over double the size. Instead of 1,700 miles, it was 3,600 miles from the Uruguay gas fields into the West European gas grid via Czechoslovakia at the time. And, uh, and it was designed to be a two-strand line, not one, mainly two huge, huge pipelines. When I talk about huge pipelines, I don't know, it's the size of the room from here to the first row or two. So just imagine, you know, the, the scale of these, of these deals. And when the two strands would have been fully subscribed, that is, customers lined up and the gas going through both pipelines, it would have taken West European dependency on Soviet gas to well over 75%, which means that dozens of countries in Western Europe would have been 100% dependent. Today, it's about 35%, and you can see that we're already in a kind of hostage situation to, uh, to Russian gas. But just imagine if Reagan hadn't come along, and I'll tell you the story in just a second, uh, to go after this line, NATO would be utterly hostage. And there'd be no freedom of action uh, for many countries. They would be utterly beholden to the Soviets. The theory by the West Europeans was, at the time, that the Soviets would never uh, use gas as a weapon and politicize it and use it as a lever because it would damage, if not destroy, their reputation as a reliable supplier and they would never do something that counterproductive to their own interests. <laughs> never happened. And so, of course, this was the argument coming back but I'm getting a little ahead of the story. Um, I, I, when I made this discovery and I was told not to pursue it anymore, um, I became an unpaid consultant to the Pentagon at the time. And I didn't know anybody in the Reagan administration, but I had written an article in the New York Times at the time called uh, Europe's Big Gamble on Soviet Gas. And there was a, uh, it was April 1st, 1981. And there was a full picture of the pipeline and the whole thing. And it was front page business section of the Sunday Times. People were reading that. And basically was trying to tell this story that West Europea, Western Europe was about to be utterly dominated by Soviet gas flows. And it was going to double their, nearly double, their hard currency earnings, their annual income in one deal. Now that's a pretty sweet deal when you end up neutralizing NATO and doubling your income at the same time. I'd say that's a fairly irresistible proposition uh, for the Kremlin then and now. So, uh, so this was turned into a larger article in the Washington Quarterly called Soviet Gas Risk or Reward that the president uh, had been given in draft, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, I had no, again, no real connections there, and, um, and he used it as the centerpiece of his arguments to the European heads of state during the G7 Ottawa summit in July of 1981, and said, look, we have to, you have to go as secure 
uh, natural gas supplies, and we recommend the accelerated development of the troll gas field in Norway because it's going to cost you more, but you're not going to again become hostage uh, to the Soviets because if they have that leverage, it's just a matter of time before they use it. You believe as an article of faith that they won't. We believe as an article of faith that they will. And of course, history has proved abundantly, just ask the Ukrainians and the Baltic states and too many others to name, that they use it routinely uh, today. And they started using it during the Soviet period when Lithuania started to get uh, the impulse for freedom to too great an extent. They buckled down on them. So the point is that today, pipeline politics is a well-known concept. And everybody understands the strategic security related nature of pipelines. But going back not so far, it, it wasn't even a thought. These were benign commercial transactions. I want to underline that because that's sort of one of the common themes between then and now. And certainly, uh, Europe regarded it that way. You know, why would you be interrupting the flow of detente? Why aren't you building these bridges? Maybe if there's a lot of Soviet gas going into Western Europe, that actually increases the, the, the incentives for partnership and cooperation, not leverage and weaponization. And again, we know in retrospect how that debate came out. So the United States was utterly isolated in this regard. And, uh, and basically, uh, I got a call in March of 82 uh, from uh, the Secretary of the National Security Advisor, the President, and I was asked, it was quite late, it was about 5.30 at night, and I was asked to come in at 7 a.m. to the West Wing of the White House and meet with Judge William P. Clark who was Reagan's chief of staff as governor of California and happened to be his best friend. And so they, 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 you know, they were one strand of DNA. I mean, they were very close. And so, uh, so I went to see Bill Clark and he said, his first question when I walked in the door was, what would you do if you worked here? I, I can't, I'll never forget uh, those words. And basically I said, well, I'm glad you asked because I do have a plan, and uh, uh, I tried to be humble about it, but I basically said, look, the Soviets make, in total, $32 billion a year. That equates to one-third of the annual revenues of General Motors annually, and if you want to use another analogy, one-third of the annual revenues of Exxon at the time. So they're running an empire from, at the time, Havana to Hanoi on hard currency equivalent to that of one-third of one American company. I said, that is not a daunting amount of money. I mean, it's just a shockingly limited. Now, of course, they really fund the empire in rubles, arms sales, all kinds of... It's not to say that hard currency is the only way they had to, to run things. But eventually you do get down to the need for cash. And uh, the ruble wasn't convertible, and so obviously it was a big deal. And, and that 32 billion came from only four sources, oil, gas, arms, and gold. Pretty much then and now. 66% of that income came from oil and gas. Then and now. Uh, remarkably, I mean, they haven't really made any progress in the last 32 years in diversifying their economy and having things uh, for sale that the world wants. China's a whole nother matter. The contrast couldn't be starker. So <clears throat> there were, then I basically said, they're spending 16 billion a year more than they make every year. And I don't see any way for them to service that debt because they're not realizing extra income streams. And they're financing the 100% of that amount by Western banks and governments. 
And I said, what that means is that we are underwriting 100% of the hard currency cost of the external Soviet empire, which coincidentally was estimated to cost 16 billion, 15, 16 billion a year. So I said, let that sink in for a minute. I didn't say 10%. I said 100% is being underwritten by us. Not so unlike where we are today. The, the numbers are different, but I'm trying to make the point that we are obviously the primary underwriters of the bad actors on this planet. And we can talk more about that in the Q's and A's. Uh, and that uh, the Siberian gas pipeline itself was going to play an invaluable role because, again, it was going to double their income, meaning that they'd still be muddling through right now. Or, uh, and not only that, of course, they were going to secure a leveraged position over NATO that could be debilitating down the road. So uh, when I finished this, oh, and I finally said, interestingly, we have a monopoly on oil and gas equipment and technology. They have to drill in permafrost in Siberia through the Ur Uruguay gas fields or under permafrost. We had the only drill bits in the world, the only technologies in the world that could do that because coincidentally we had already developed the north slope of Alaska. And that required us to get through permafrost, but nobody else in the world had those technologies. And so I certainly mentioned that we have an extraordinary position here because all of that equipment, uh, that technology is licensed to Europe by the United States. That's our technology that we can ultimately control. And so Bill said, uh, he listened to this and said, what are you doing at nine o'clock? And I said, <clears throat> you know, which was about, uh, I don't know, uh, an hour from the time we were talking. And I said, nothing, I'm, I'm staying around. Uh, I'm just here to see you. And he said, good, because I want you to tell the president what you just told me. And so I had the opportunity from zero association with these folks uh, to, uh, to be you know, in the Oval Office with the president and his best friend, the National Security Advisor, you know, having this conversation. Uh, and that's why I know that what Reagan's instincts have always been, because he said so and just said, I never had the numbers that validated uh, these suspicions. And Bill Clark said, what do you want to do, Mr. President? And he said, I don't care how you do it, just do it. Meaning, go for a strategy that was designed to cripple so the Soviet hard currency cash flow by going after its sources of, of money, particularly oil and gas, obviously, and to basically do something about the fact that we were funding the, the at the time, evil empire with Western governments and banks. And not only were we funding, but we were funding on subsidized interest rates, below market interest rates, because the Soviets were considered a less developed country that, that was getting rates 2% below the global market. So Western taxpayers were picking up the tab for their interest rates. So you had sort of this insult to injury. You know, it just, every time you, you listen to the story, the more you dug into it, you saw, uh, it was like we were on a humanitarian mission to make sure that the Soviets were prospering or at least stable. And so we were dedicated to, to upending that. So to make a long story short, uh, we took the following steps. You have to remember that during the time I'm talking about the Siberian gas pipeline being announced, 
and contracts being signed and this huge juggernaut is going to transform uh, the, the Soviet survivability. Tens of thousands of Soviet troops were massing on the Polish border. Solidarity was in full swing. They demanded that Jaruzelski of Poland kill Solidarity and silence the Catholic Church because John Paul obviously was a great advocate of freedom. And that if they didn't declare martial law instantly, the Soviets would invade. So I don't know how many hundred thousand troops they had there massing on the border, but we could see it with the overhead and that was the way, that was the situation. And ultimately, of course, Jaruzelski did imp uh, impose martial law. And the president initially was being told by the Pentagon and others, let's throw the Polish economy into default because they didn't have any money and we were able to push, the, they had borrowed too much from the West and we could push them into default and this would penalize the Poles. And when I was a consultant to Pentagon, I said, no, 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 what, why? I mean, the Poles, it's true, you know, have been malfeasant, but they're a victim. They're not the perpetrator of this. This is a Soviet-sponsored event. Let's use this event, let's use martial law to go after the Siberian gas pipeline, to go after the credits, to go after oil prices. I mean, let's use this as our moment to go after the Soviet economy in earnest and see if we can squeeze these guys and crush their ability over time to take malevolent actions against us and our allies. And that argument did win the day. And Reagan declared oil and gas equipment sanctions in December of 81 against the Soviets. He got a pledge from the Europeans not to, not to undermine our sanctions, uh, which they did promptly. And they took up all the contracts that had been given to US manufacturers, even though, again, they had pledged not to do so. And when we begged them to stop lease subsidized credits, they agreed to do that at the Versailles summit in May of 82, and then within a half hour, reneged and said, we're not going to change our interest rate policy toward the Soviets. Now this is Helmut Kohl and Francois Mitterrand, just to be clear. So you can see that then and now, we have the same fundamental ideological disconnect which is us politique and still the belief that bridge building, Nord Stream 2, which is ironically the second strand of the Siberian gas pipeline, we'll talk about that, uh, is the way to go. And our view is that all we're dueling, doing is fueling repression and fueling belligerent actions against the West. So you can see that uh, we weren't, we were in a major disconnect with Europe and we had to make a decision. Most of the cabinet wanted to back down and basically lift the sanctions because we couldn't get allied agreement and the view was if it's unilateral US is it really, you know, is it really going to be worth that level of estrangement with the allies? Uh, and there were a few folks, <laughs> Secretary of Defense, Director of CIA, National Security Advisor, and Ed Meese, who was Counselor of the President, said, no, 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 we're, this, is, this is a matter of principle. And we're going to stick with the sanctions. Not only that, we're going to double down. And in June, of, of, uh, June 18, 1982, there was a very fateful and historic NSC meeting where this animated, bitter conversation between the Reagan cabinet played out. I had done the briefing, you know, the, the decision memo, uh, it was my area, and at the end of this thing, there was a cabinet, a general cabinet consensus to lift the sanctions because it just wasn't working. And the president ended the meeting by saying, well, 
they can have their dam pipeline. And there was a collective sigh in the room, relief, because the Allies were out of their minds with anger at this stage that we were trying to take this un undue, unjustified hostile action. And then he added, but, but not with our equipment and not with our technology. And henceforth, anybody that's using U.S. licenses or subsidiaries is going to be prohibited from supplying the pipeline. That means we're going to take ex action to take extraterritorial legal action to stop Western Europe from using our technology to send in the turbines, to send in the compressor stations, to send in the drill bits. Nothing goes. And when this happened, all hell broke loose and the greatest allied dispute, NATO dispute in, in history to this day, took place then. This is a $35 billion deal. Exports, jobs, hundreds of thousands of European jobs on the line. And you know how European leaders are about jobs. So it was, it was a shocking development because it was also the application of of U.S. law extraterritorially. So uh, a huge uh, problem ensued and the Allies decided they were going to ship all of the equipment, including our technology, over our objection on the basis that this is these are our companies. You sold us this technology a long time ago. We, you know, we're not going to honor any kind of end user agreement or whatever, much like Siemens is facing with the movement of their turbines to Crimea in the last two days and the fact that they're suing right now uh, the, so the Russians uh, because again of an end-user problem it's a little bit more of the then and now but this time it was Western Europe that says you know we're not going to play and uh, when they started shipping over our objection we had a decision to make what do we do about that and the answer was and I had recommended import controls against the companies that were shipping. Now, import controls is sort of the nuclear weapon of economic sanctions. It means that the entire U.S. market is closed to your goods and services, and the U.S. financial system and dollar-denominated transactions are prohibited. So, in other words, you can do business with the Soviets, or you can do business with the United States, but you're not going to do both. And within six months of those sanctions, four of the six companies went out of business, and 250,000 workers spilled into the streets unemployed. In other words, if you want to play hardball, which we were prepared to play, this is what's going to happen to you. So, to make a long story short again, uh, Europe decided, well, okay, uh, we'll limit, we'll go ahead and do what the U.S. wants to do. We limited Soviet gas deliveries to a ceiling of 30% of total West European supplies. We did this in the International Energy Agency. We went to the OECD, we raised them from a less developed country to a developed country and eliminated the subsidies on the credit arrangements. We cautioned private commercial banks informally to basically realize that this was an untenable credit risk because they had no way to service. And we tightened technology controls in the, in the Coordinating Committee on, on Export Controls and basically ended up, we couldn't kill the first round of the pipeline because it was already signed up, but we delayed it by three years. Now this is 15 billion a year for three years that we delayed. And we killed the second strand completely. So the second strand of the Siberian gas pipeline was never built. And it is Nord Stream 2. So it took them, what, 31, 32 years to resurrect the full, the full show of what we're talking about right now. 
And this is happening in real time. So there's this extraordinary connective tissue between then and now in this, in this, in this regard. And so the Soviet economy muddled on for a few years. We felt that they couldn't sustain themselves with this new regime of allied agreements. And indeed, a couple of days, I think it was two or three days before the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in, 90, in December of 91, they defaulted on 96 billion in, in hard currency Western debt. So the question you need to ask yourself, is there any connection between the default on all of their hard currency debt and the collapse of the Soviet Union two or three days later? <laughs> right? I don't think that's a big leap. So when folks are telling you that it was you know, Gorbachev's democratic impulses that led to the end of the Soviet Union and the economic rigidities, which is true, contributed, and these things may have, but the fact of the matter is that the strategy I'm talking about was known to maximum 13 people in the United States. And for a while, one of them wasn't the Secretary of State. In other words, this is a very closely held event. It was the most secret thing we were doing was a coordinated economic and financial assault on the Soviets. Folks saw it, some of it, they, they knew we were going after the pipeline, and they knew we were going after the credits, and we, they knew that something happened with the Saudis because they started to pump two million barrels a day more which I didn't mention, but that was part of the plan because we could shape oil prices and did. We had, we prevailed on the, on the Saudis to do that covertly. We decontrolled na natural gas prices at the wellhead in the United States and oil fell to $10 a barrel. Well, for every drop of $1 in the price of a barrel of oil, the Soviets lost $500 million to a $1 billion. Now, mind you, they start with $32 billion, right? That's it. So think about the implications of that. And you've seen what's happened to them, of course, with the decline in oil prices now. And the fact that anytime that's under 50, they start to sweat bullets. So, again, an, a, a fairly astounding parallel. Uh, so anyway, that was, uh, is, a, is, a, um, is a story that um, has not really been told that may, there's a film being discussed about this, but it was such a close whole thing that there's never really been an adequate explanation of the fact that there was a very coherent plan. Now, some of these very secret documents are now available, and one of them is National Security Decision Directive, so-called NSDD. These are called National Security Decision Directive 66 and 75. And if you ever look them up, and they're easy to find on the internet, you'll find them instantly. Uh, remember that the, you need to see the summary of conclusions in NSDD 66 because it's, uh, it's where the action is. And sometimes I found on the internet they're not including the summary of conclusions. But both of these are signed in hand by the president. And those signatures you know, are on the documents. But when you realize that nobody saw those documents and they're not part of the historic record even now, Despite the fact that the president's signature is on them, it's not like I'm, you know, trying to make up a yarn here. This is documented. And nobody really understood that this was a coherent plan. Using, again, that middle ground between words and military action. Non-kinetic means to set 300 million people free, including a number of your parents, and for that matter, yourselves, of folks in the room, without a shot fire. Now, if Yuri and Dropoff hadn't gotten cancer and died, this probably would have had a different, very bad outcome, because he knew that there was something going on uh, on the economic and financial front that was a deliberate attack. And he was preparing, you know, for the possibility of a preemptive strike in 1983 because it was kind of a use it or lose it 
thing. He knew that he was going to lose in the economic and financial battle space. He knew. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize. Just like Russia today, the economy is smaller than that of Spain. And these guys are walking around feeling like they're 10 feet, feet tall because we let them. Because we're not serious about sanctions and we're not using a fingernail of what we have. That's, those are the facts. During the Reagan days, if I may say, and it, this is not supposed to be chest beating, but we were serious. We wanted to win. We weren't interested in complicating their lives or harassing them or delivering some temporary setback. This was about ending it. Now. And they fumbled through, you know, they muddled through for a few years and then they went down. And now they're back, kind of. But they're back in a much weakened condition. And if we were serious, we could deal with that in rather short order, which we're not. Do we still have the same disconnect with Europe? Yes. You know, you, can, you know for yourselves by, on the basis of what I'm saying, sort of where we sit. So, I thought, you know, even though this was supposed to be a talk about where we are right now and what we're up to in terms of looking at the granular transactions of Russia and China, it, it seems that, I mean, it occurs to us that this is a story that could be very instructive in terms of understanding where economic and financial tools can fit when you're dealing with adversaries. Uh, obviously, we've, you've seen the nature of the sanctions against Iran, and when did they get serious? Iran got serious about coming to the table on the nuclear deal when we started to deny their banks, uh, sanction their banks, and when we started to cut off access to the U.S. financial system of anybody that was aiding and abetting Iran. And all of a sudden, boom, they're at the table. You, we can critique the agreement, you know, I mean, I'm not suggesting that, that this is a wonderful hermetically sealed deal, but you can get, you understand that this is what gets people's attention. Uh, the Chinese are worried that even though it's a two-bit bank of Guangdong, or sorry, Dondong Bank, uh, is now being excluded from the U.S. financial system because of its dealings with, with North Korea. Now that could be China's five largest banks if we wanted it to be. We chose a small, out-of-the-way bank, like we did with uh, the Bank of Macau, uh, several years ago, and we're just making the point that this is what China can look forward to if they don't play ball on truly using their leverage over their wholly owned subsidiary, North Korea. So we still are packing the gear in terms of our utter dominance of the economic and financial domain that we, the West, built after World War II, Bretton Woods, I mean, this is our international trading and financial system that is being systematically abused every day by the Russians and Chinese for a host of reasons, not only their survival and prosperity, but for nation capturing, to be able to buy the strategic assets, to be able to buy the critical infrastructure projects across the globe, whether it's in Africa to just basically own the minerals and natural resources there, which you know about. Uh, it's about compromising the Greeces, uh, the, 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 the Hungarians, the Slovaks, increasingly the Czechs with Zeman putting the welcome mat out for that. And, uh, and you know how it goes from there. So we can talk about uh, the way in which they're using their levers uh, in the legitimate, legal, international trading and financial system to basically conduct what we estimate to be 40% of today's hybrid warfare. If you think about hybrid warfare and you break it down, how much is actual military action? 20%? How much is cyber? How much is disinformation? How much is espionage? You know, 10, 15, 20, 20, you know, 20 here, 20 there. 
Well, where's the biggest piece of the action? Economic and financial. I don't think without, without any question. Uh, does the American military take into account economic and financial hybrid warfare? No. Is NSC seized with this? Do we have working groups on this? No. Does anybody in, West, in Western Europe give a rat's ass about this? No. Not really. So you don't even see this on the horizon in a serious way. And isn't that odd? And it might occur to you is because this is where the adversaries on the planet live and die. They live and die here. And the Soviet example is an empirically provable example. It's not my opinion. The great thing about economics and finance is it's about the numbers. And that's why the president liked it, because he finally saw some numbers. And you and I, I mean, all of us can have different opinions on missile defense. You know, you could say that it, 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 it uh, catalyzes an arms race. And I can say that, you know, it's fundamental to the protection of our populations. And at the end, we agree to disagree, and where are we? But this is not that. This is a different game. So, uh, in a way, it's because this portfolio is so potent that, you know, it's kind of held at arm's length because nobody wants to politicize the markets. We don't want to discourage the free flow of capital and trade. Everybody thinks that this is going to, in effect, weaponize the markets in some way. I mean, these are the downside risks. Or that China is going to be put up against the wall if they start to see their sovereign credit rating falling, their cost of borrowing rising, F, uh, foreign direct investment drying up, uh, their state-owned enterprises becoming radioactive because of their security-related abuses, access to the capital markets limited. I mean, if we were to do the things that we could do, there are a number of thoughtful people that believe that it's more than the Chinese could bear and they might lash out and it might go military and they might get their back up against the wall and the same is true with the Russians. So it's not to say these aren't legitimate concerns but to abandon our most potent tools because we're afraid of what the reactions might be is also not on. And we had the same kind of considerations, and frankly, as I say, that's why we got lucky that Andropov didn't live, because he actually got this, and that's not good. That's why we were trying to keep it to 13 people, because this is heavy stuff. It's sensitive. And this is where, guess what? This is where the money is. Do people care about money? You think? Right? So, I'm just trying to help you break the code on that, a precious commodity called the truth here, as opposed to layers of political correctness that are neutralizing some of the finest tools in our arsenal and in a domain that we control. So, what we have done about that in the, in, uh, gosh, well, I'll just say quickly, what we're doing about this now is we're trying to track and visually map you know, every state-controlled transaction of China and Russia globally on a daily basis and put it up on the map. And uh, we've done this, we have five, about five years of data and you'll see it's displayed in a whole variety of ways. But basically, uh, we don't, this is not about a takedown strategy. This isn't about trying to replicate you know, how to take down China or how to take down Russia. If I said I didn't believe we could do that, I'd be lying. But that's not where we are. But in terms of early warning, in terms of situational awareness, 
in terms of understanding uh, how they're prosecuting hybrid warfare, how they're compromising allied countries, how they're successfully engaging in nation, nation capturing despite an economy the size of Spain, you know, you've got to be thinking about how do they do this. And the answer is we pick up the tab, essentially, as always. So uh, there's a little film, like four minutes, to give you a, a, and this is a little bit older, I mean, it has the narration of my esteemed colleague in the back of the room, Andrew Davenport, who also happens to be the architect of the Intel Track software that we've invested our shirts to make into a robust tool. And at least this will be in a short form way to give you a sense of the tools that we're trying to make available at PSSI and, and frankly we, that we're doing corporately as well uh, to illuminate this issue and put it back in as a centerpiece of the policy considerations where it always should have been. And finally, if we're, if we're really doing our job, we're creating the sixth domain of American warfighting. Air, land, sea, cyber, space, and the economic and financial warfighting domain, what we call the ENF warfighting domain. So I don't think it'll probably ever be called the sixth domain because of the sensitivities that I'm talking about. But if we simply have it institutionalized as a layer of capability across the military and across our entire security community from NSC to the intelligence community, we will be satisfied we've done our job, but not a minute before, not until. So, the videotape. Do I do something here? Is there... Cutter, is the volume on? No. Oh, so you can do one. Excuse me. Okay. Go to the videotape. Not happening. Yeah. Uh, while we're grappling unnecessarily with the technical problems, um, there's another element to this that you need to think about. And it is um, the, we talked a little bit about the disparity between Europe's philosophical approach toward economic, financial, commercial relationships with Russia, China versus our own. And there's another kind of institutional disparity between the language of the markets, or the lexicon of the markets and the lexicon of the security community. When we think about the international trading and financial system and the global markets and market players, you know, we would, you'd think that we could convince them to do the right thing for reasons of patriotism, for reasons of national security, or just plain to do the right thing by not, I mean, by being much more disciplined about where their money's going and how it's being used to make sure that they're avoiding malevolent actors who are involved in things like island building in the South China Sea and militarization of same, or are principal underwriters of the North Korean nuclear threat, or funding in the past genocide in Sudan. You know, you want some modicum of corporate governance and social responsibility and some shred of security mindedness and an instinct, an impulse to do what's best for your country and for human freedom. 
Forget about that. That's not happening. They think that's somebody else's job. Their job is return on investment, ASAP, to get that bonus. Now, it's a little, un I'm a Wall Street guy, so in a way I'm criticizing my own industry, or at least a, a former Wall Street guy. I certainly am not one now. Uh, but, you know, the, it's not to be a, an indictment. It's just that they're occupied with other things. So you have to figure out what do they care about and how can we convince the markets in another creative way to do the right thing. So in the category of what they care about, you've got they care about financial risk because they might take losses. They care about share value because they've got you know, angry shareholders if they don't. They care about corporate reputation and brand, thank God, a lot, for good reason, as you know. They care about transparency and disclosure because there could be some nasty surprises for them if there's inadequate disclosure. They care about reliable statistics, and they care about corporate governance, not because they actually do, for the most part, but because their shareholders make them care about corporate governance, thank goodness. And they care about rule of law because they need somebody to arbitrate commercial disputes if things go wrong. Well, you know, Russia and China has few of any of these, and yet the markets are still willing to play ball enthusiastically in some cases. Not so much Russia, but certainly China. And so the creative job of the security community is to do things that will send signals to the markets that spook them, that have a chilling effect. There are ways to elevate the risk. Information is the coin of the realm in... Uh, in the markets. And fortunately, you know, we have information. And the intelligence community has sources and methods, and if they were to use them properly, they could collect market relevant damaging information if they wished. All factual, no disinformation here, real abuses, real problems. So there are ways to elevate the risk. And in terms of highlighting who their companies really are, you know, let's, we could talk about that briefly. I mean, who are the Chinese SOEs and the Russian state-owned enterprises and the like? Well, you know, they're, they're sanctions violators. They're WMD proliferators. They're PLA contractors or associated with the Russian military. They've engaged in, in cyber hacking, particularly the Chinese, against Western firms. They're human and labor rights abusers. They're environmental degradators. They engage in technology theft. They build militarized islands in the South China Sea and fuel a nuclear threat against a number of our allies, including our, ourselves, out of North Korea. And they are heavily engaged in espionage. Well, a lot of this can be found in the public, in the public open source. So we're looking for this kind of, if you were to use a polite term, risk profile, but it's really dirt. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the truth on who are these folks and who are their subsidiaries? What does their corporate family look like? Where are they doing business in the world? You know, do you have PLA companies that are also listed on the New York Stock Exchange? Answer, yes. Do you have... Uh, an amazing array of bad actors in joint ventures with some of our most prestigious Western companies. Yes. And it's odd because security-minded due diligence doesn't seem to be in vogue at all. You know, you're, you're using classic means of diligence, but you're not looking at, again, the security portfolio. So, 
This is what we're also trying to assist is if we don't, if we just keep talking about this in national security terms, we're going to feel good about ourselves and we're going to feel great about our like-minded friends and we're going to say, yeah, you know, we've got a great idea here, but the markets aren't hearing us. They're not even listening to that. You talk about the fact that we're going to create an asymmetric risk to your share value and your corporate reputation and brand, then all of a sudden, boom, bang, they're awake and they're listening. What? I mean, that's what I mean by elevating the risk. So if you were trying to basically take um, what, what the, those discoveries were in the Soviet case and update this as to how to play the game in a far more complex milieu today, this is how we think is the way to go. Because if we don't bring the markets along, we're sitting there talking to ourselves. And by the way, congressional legislation and sanctions talks to the markets. You know, uh, uh, what was it, a nine billion, $19 billion fine for BNP Paribas? What? Nine billion. Nine billion, I'm sorry. Nine billion. But still, it was a powerful shot across the bow in terms of corporate reputation, share value, and public opprobrium. So there are ways. Some of them are, you know, with a baseball bat, like a $9 billion fine. But others are more subtle. And for example, you know, Siemens is not exactly a advocate of security-minded discipline, is a polite way to put it. But they are nervous about the fact that their turbines are ending up in a sanctioned Crimea because the Soviets, the Russians, sorry, easy slip by the way, uh, because the Russians move the equipment there surreptitiously. And in the last 24 hours they found out there was another shipment of turbines, uh, so Siemens has, is not having a good day. Anyway, you, you, I hope this explains it. Now, so what, where are we now? So, I recommend if you want, I can just take two minutes to show the live tool and then just go to Q&A. We've got 30 minutes of uh -huh. do, uh, do we have some uh, slides? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, Andrew will show you what we got, or at least a little something of what we got. But if you want to see more on what we're doing here, go to rwradvisory.com. And rwradvisory.com. And that will give you a sense, because all of that capability is moved into PSSI. So basically, as a think tank, uh, we have access to, of course, all these tools. They're developed by PSSI principles. And they're ours, full stop. Um, and I, the good news is that sometime uh, we could talk more privately about who's using these tools uh, and the fact that we are starting to get some traction here and some of the, in some of the countries that, that are represented here. So, please. So this is Intel Track, and it basically just, it's not trying to differentiate necessarily between what's what's good and what's bad and what's strategic and security minded and what's just purely commercial. So the intention behind building Intel Track was to establish an empirical data sort data based data based fully sourced aggregation of what China and Russia is doing in the economic and financial space globally so that we can have a smart, intelligent, informed, relatively unbiased conversation about how they are position positioning themselves many times through state-owned enterprises. We started off focusing only on state-owned enterprises and moved from there more into the private sector. Folks around Washington didn't really see the distinction when you're talking about Russia and China between state-owned and the private sector um, with these particular two countries having unique characteristics. So 
we started with looking at just state owned, we moved a bit bigger than that. And basically what you're looking at here is a map uh, where all of these transactions are tagged at the city level. So all of the blue dots represent uh, Chinese transactions and all of the Russian dots represent Russian transactions. And you can, mine, or you can sort your way through the information based on any number of filters. So for example, if all you cared about was Huawei and you want to understand how Huawei has positioned itself globally, you can take a look at Huawei, take a look at all the subsidiaries activity under Huawei, because we're not just looking at the top company, but every subsidiary of that entity, subsidiary of the subsidiary, and subsidiary of the subsidiary of the subsidiary. So many times when you're dealing with these entities, they'll create various um, you know, strategies to invest overseas. So this is just an example of understanding Huawei's footprint. And if you're going to do business with Huawei, it might be relevant to understand where are they doing business in the world? Are they doing business in risky countries? Are they doing business with risky entities uh, in order to get a good idea of their profile? Drag line. Uh, and every transaction has a date, and so you're able to kind of see how this footprint evolves over time. Think about it. And uh, you can look by country or region to, in order to aggregate the data to try to find trends. So, of course, when you're talking about data, everybody's trying to extract meaning. People are getting a little bit frustrated today that everybody's putting dots on a map. And uh, there's so much data, but not you know, as much actually seeking to understand it. So we've built in some tools, and we've, we're importing this data into other tools as well to try to extract the meaning and the trends behind the information. So when you look at it at the country level, you can kind of get a sense where is Huawei spending its time. You could also be sorting the information based on all telecom or all energy. You could do a similar map for Russia energy and try to get a handle on that. Russia nuclear, a, you know, we've been spending a lot of time looking at Rosatom. Um, because of the strategic dimensions of that. There's lots of different reasons why you might want to look at this information, and so I could run any number of different kinds of searches, sorted and filtered based on different kinds of industries or companies or regions. You can compare the information based on number of transactions taking place in these places or project value associated with these transactions. We can compare, we can visualize bubbles based on the percentage of a country's GDP that is made up of these transaction values. So if your goal is to determine, say, what kind of control and influence might be implied by doing a lot of business with a certain country, then you might care, well, if, well, for example, if we look at Huawei, and uh, this is just by number of transactions. So we can see, you know, they have many transactions in the US, they have many transactions in India. So by pure how many transactions are they doing, this is kind of the visual you get. If you compare these transactions as a percentage of these countries' GDP, you see where, how does that translate into influence? So they may have a lot of business in the US, but you know, it's not gonna deliver them political influence, per se, because it's just a small fraction of our economy. But when you look at what kind of influence, say, their investment in information technology might have in Western Africa or Eastern Africa, you see, you know, and Huawei is a little bit of a narrow example, but if you were just looking at all Chinese activity globally, for example, and trying to understand, well, where does this activity translate into political influence? Um, Can you run that? Yeah. Let's do all of China. Take a look. This is 365 days a year, by the way. Sometimes the data gets a little skewed where like, you know, you have a big transaction somewhere in Micronesia and because their GDP is what it is, it blows up on the map. And then you got to work the data to make sure you're not generating strange results. And so actually I was showing this to someone who was looking at um, China's influence in the Arctic. And uh, I think the Greenland bubble is Denmark or uh, what's that? Iceland. Or in any case, they were, they, want, they were interested in visualizing the Chinese activity in the members of the Arctic Circle, or of the, what do you call the group that administers the Arctic, Arctic Circle? Council. The Arctic Council. And uh, you know, the idea being, how do they gain, you know, the more business they're doing in these countries that have a voting position on this particular body, the more influence they may have over policy with respect to that part of the world. So, anyway. 
I could run any number of different searches to try to make a number of different points. The economic and financial threat domain, war fighting domain, whatever you want to call it, has many different dimensions from soft power to, you know, more specific malevolent intent. But I think maybe giving you time for Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. why don't we take, we're, we're at time, but we're going to basically extend uh, a little bit because of the cyber presentation by 15 minutes or even a half hour. So we have about, and I apologize for this because the questions are really uh, what this is supposed to be about, and I did talk at you too long. But remember, too, that a lot of the subjects you're hearing about are quite established, and you went in, you came in, knowing uh, probably a lot about some of this. I suspect that this particular portfolio is one that you might lo know somewhat less about. It's still a bit cutting edge, and it's still not established uh, the way it should be, and therefore we felt it required more of a core dump than, uh, than would have otherwise been the case. So why don't we take the, the rest of the time for Q&A, and, and Andrew can come back if you want to, for example, see something that's been on your mind, and you want to visualize it and see what we can do instantaneously to illuminate the answer, we, we can put you in the driver's seat and run this thing on the basis of whatever it is you want to see. Just to demonstrate, again, that you know, when you ask a question, this thing, uh, there's an awfully good chance that it's going to give you an answer. It, it may not be the definitive policy answer, but it's certainly going to give you more tools, we hope, than you have now to be able to answer this in a empirical, uh, in a, an empirical fashion that strengthens your arguments or validates your suspicions or whatever it may be. So, with that, let's uh, take it for questions. Yes. Uh, so the, the psychological dimensions of warfare more, more generally yeah. as a kind of domain. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, uh, what I think is happening with cyber and what's happening with economic and financial, which is that it's running through <laughs> the, the domains that exist. Uh, I don't know that in a, even the economic and financial, which deserves its own domain, for reasons I've tried to at least partially explain, I don't think it's going to be announced as a standalone. So I tend to think that the psychological will be in that category, and it'll, it'll be imbued in a number of these domains. It'll have a distinct role, that's for sure. For example, uh, the psychological domain, I mean the psychological dimensions of the economic and financial domain are, are pretty profound because you have an allergy to, on the part of market players and on the part of most of the countries in the world, are not anxious to see the international trading and financial system politicized or weaponized beyond a certain point because all of a sudden, you know, will this make the market's more of a casino type thing without the kind of level of security and stability and assuredness that, uh, that the markets really uh, crave. You know, they, they want stability, they want predictability, and when they see uh, stuff happening in their, in their world of what I'm talking about, uh, like sanctions, I mean, they hate sanctions, and, they, and they, they think the national security community is a net negative to them. I mean, one of the reasons that the national security community doesn't have a lot of Wall Street skills in it and doesn't have these mixed, this particular skill mix of Wall Street and national security is because there's actually a little bit of antipathy between the two. You know, the market guys 
think the national security types are, are disruptive Neanderthals. And the national security community thinks that they're unpatriotic prophets uber alles opportunists. For good reason, I might add, but never mind. Uh, because that, again, it's not so much a criticism, but, it, you know, unfortunately, it's the way they're wired. So you don't have lots of Wall Street guys going down and saying, I'm going to use my skills to advance America and, and allied security interests, unfortunately. So hopefully, you know, that's one of the things that PSSI in both Prague and Washington is, is designed to do. I mean, this is a big emphasis of ours, not surprisingly. And what we're trying to do is build a cadre, a, a generations of, of security-minded policy practitioners that are going to start dusting off the lessons of the past, uh, like the Soviet case, update it, which we're trying to do here, and for God's sake, go with it. Because it's that or shooting. And words ain't going to get you there. Diplomacy is looked at by Beijing and Moscow with utter contempt. And they, they play the game and then they go behind closed doors and laugh about, you know, what weak fools we are. So there's too much cynicism to count on diplomacy, even though it plays a very important role, and I believe in it, but it has its limitations. And military action goes without saying this is something that we should be seeking to avoid. So if you've got better ideas as to what the middle ground is in which we're going to play, I want to hear it. Because I've been looking for it for over 40 years, and I'm not, not seeing it. So maybe you guys know. Right? Where do we play? How do we respond without shooting, without killing people? This is my answer. This is PSSI's answer. And I think that, and I think it's a good answer. And I know it works. Yes? Sorry, just to clarify, so is it, is it literally uh, non-cooperation by the financial regulation industry that means that this is not the sixth uh, level of warfare? Of warfare? Yeah, it's not just the market and the regulatory bodies. Well, it is if you include Treasury. I mean, for you know, the Ministry of Finance and, or something like that, or Chancellor of the Exchequer, all, all of these folks would be, would be very cautious to allergic somewhere on that spectrum about this kind of thing. And the SEC is not getting a security-minded mandate from, in our case, the executive branch and the White House to be told to screen for this kind of thing. You, you've got Treasury that should have its own much more elaborate, including classified version of Intel track, but don't. The Intel community should have this, be all over this. To our knowledge, they're not. And I'll, I would, for what it's worth, I would urge you to ask internally uh, at Whitehall and elsewhere, how much of this kind of thing is at the ready in the UK? And I don't think you're going to like the answer. Because we got an answer. It's not a classified answer, so I'm, I'm reserving on it. But the answer is no. And, and UK is a pretty robust security-minded place, as is the Five Eyes. So if you don't have it in the ultimate alliance structure, where is it? I mean, the Russians and the Chinese are out here every day. They, they move their entire strategic portfolio into the plain light of day because they know that we're not monitoring it. We're not trying to interdict them there because if it's legal, it looks benign and commercial, and that's sort of it. When you think of CFIUS and what a weak read it is, what, we interdict a transaction every six months or so on some ad hoc basis? We don't have a systematic screening every day of how adversaries and potential adversaries are compromising ourselves and our allies. Do we? And if not, why not? I mean, little PSSI 
and RWR advisory are small, under-resourced operations, okay? So why do we have it? You know, in other words, it can be done. So we're, you know, we're, we're proud to, to be out there on this, but we're also a bit frustrated because, you know, where's the cavalry coming over the ridge? You know, we're fighting, you know, a, a, a force far larger than ourselves, but I'm not looking at, the, I'm not seeing the help on the way. You know, that army that's supposed to be there ain't there in the economic and financial domain. <laughs> So that would be my answer. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for the presentation. And my question is going to lead up to Nord Stream 2. Uh, earlier this month, uh, the Budapest uh, Energy Institute came out with a report of its possible effects in Europe. Uh, for specifically for Bulgaria, for example, we stand to lose about uh, 280 million annually if North Stream 2 is completed. At the same time, they also concluded we just built an additional interconnector with Greece, we would save about 157 million. Now, there was somewhat of a quick reaction in Bulgaria, at least on a NGO level, and the Center for Civic Democracy organized a closed round table to discuss this and how they can sponsor. The, the two speakers which gave us the briefings were Martin Vladimir, who was the motor behind the energy security aspect of the coming playbook together with the CSAS, and the other was uh, Ilya Zaslavsky, who well, is now a US citizen and is not talking very much in Russia. Uh, and they seemed rather certain of Russia's incapacity to afford these deals. Uh, I've also been told that regarding the Turkey Stream project, the idea was even at one point to take back, put and take back money from his inner circle in order to finance Gazprom to go through this deal. At the same time, with Nord Stream 2, uh, the terrain is considered rather difficult. The investments it is uncertain where they're going to come from, and uh, of course there are uh, ish, there are ways that Russia can do that. I recall that when it was up to the South Stream pipeline, which was supposed to go to Bulgaria. Our idea, the idea to do that was uh, for Gazprom to loan us the money to do it would almost double the interest rate that they, uh, the rate that they usually do and also the highest price of natural gas which would be selling to Europe. But still, my idea is how, uh, how would Russia be able to finance that and is actually still somebody in Europe who is going to be picking up the bill because of uh, Europe not trying to see in the distance and preparing for what Russia is at one point surely going to use that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'd say that, I mean, I, <laughs> I'd be thrilled if that analysis is correct and that Nord Stream 2 collapses on its own way due to lack of adequate resourcing by Moscow. But I don't see that, that these guys have a way to get this done, especially with help from Germany and that's uh, explicit or in other manner, in other ways, to encourage uh, financing for this. The Chinese have already been in discussions on Nord Stream 2 on an in-principle basis to step in, and they do have the money. Uh, so I think that Nord Stream 2 is going to find itself funded, and I will predict for you that the Chinese will be involved. And before it's over, I think you'll see uh, West European financing as well. Uh, and even uh, the Soviets are back in the Eurobond market. They've just had a successful sovereign offering for the first time since uh, the invasion of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, their companies are going into the Eurobond, mar Eurobond market. Gazprom is planning a major offering, obviously a dual-use weaponized Russian uh, state-owned enterprise, a major offender out there. And what does it tell you that they can go to, I mean, the Eurobond market, the beauty is I give you a piece of paper that says I'm going to pay you back in seven or ten years, and you give me billions of dollars in untied, unencumbered cash for my discretionary use. Just so we understand what a bond is. Don't be thrown off by the word bond. You know, just means that I give you this and you give me the cash. No questions asked. So when the Soviets, excuse me, when the Russians are able to return to the bond market 
to an enthusiastic reception where the markets were basically saying, boy, have we missed you. You know, uh, oil prices are doing a bit better. You guys are weathering the storm. It's buy time. I mean, what's wrong with that picture? Last time I checked, you know, there's still dying going on in eastern Ukraine. I mean, look at your Black Sea exercise and ask me, I mean, answer, you know, is this going to happen or not? I mean, I, I think the answer is yes. I think the scenario, the simulation we're working on is real. So we're not in a wind down in Ukraine. We might still be in a ramping up if what you're working on right now turns out to be valid. So again, nobody is minding the store. Do you think that the U.S. Uh, made an interventions in Western Europe about all of the West European banks that participated in those Eurobond offerings and who subscribed? Do you think we came to them and, and, and said, look, don't, for God's sake, don't invest in, in, in Russian sovereign bonds now? Do you think anybody delivered that mail? No. Let's just leave it there in terms of an utter collapse of political will. I mean, what a sickening excuse for policy. I mean, if I can show just a flash of outrage here. You know? I mean, it, it, it is a pathetic display. And, and you know, the fact that, that the Russians are going to be able to find a workaround for Nord Stream with Germany cheerleading in the background from Merkel on down, you think that they're not going to provide the dough? I mean, Germany was desperate to keep Gorbachev alive and the Soviet Union a going concern. They were moving in tens of billions of dollars when there was no prospect of Soviet repayment. They were ramping up their lending, trying to save the Soviet Union. And Deutsche Bank was in the lead on that. And its chairman, Alfred Herrhausen, and they were being directed to do that because it was felt the same thing it is today. There's a, it's a sort of a protection racket and you're paying off the mafia because you had 19 million of your citizens held hostage on the other side of the wall and you wanted to make life better for them. So Germany's got a lot, you know, um, it doesn't have a great history on this. And that's why I'm concerned about Nord Stream 2, which is sitting right there. You're telling me the Germans aren't going to help them get this thing done, even if, the, even if they're talking to the Chinese and doing one of these? I mean, my best guess. Now, mind you, this is a, this is a little bit uh, uh, politically incorrect conversation we're having right now. But then again, you know, let's break training and tell the truth. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you know, also about the simulation a little bit. Um, I mean, you know, you called the Russia and the China, you know, bad actors and mafia. And so if we do go after them in this, you know, sixth realm of, of the economic, uh, how do we know that, you know, how can we be sure that they won't retaliate in another fighting realm? Like, you know, just actual war, war you know, if we push them too far. Well, right. So I think our group, the U.S., we have been a little bit, uh, you know, cautious. Yes, and, and and as you know, I just addressed that point, that yeah, you know, there are thoughtful people that have this exact concerns, and I myself, I'm not saying you know go, go flat out, and put these guys up against the wall. I mean, even we managed the Soviet collapse so that they wouldn't understand too starkly that it was actually all over. And we didn't want them to know that they were the walking dead. We wanted them to keep walking, right? Because otherwise they see it as a direct economic and financial attack and they might view it as an existential threat to one party communist rule in the case of China or Putinism or whatever he wants to call his crony kleptocracy over there in Moscow but they could go away and you know you don't want to put them into use it or lose it time I'll buy that but if you think that that should be 
an excuse for the nothingness that exists today, how cynical and defeatist is that? I mean, that's where we are. And that's what I can't abide by. Uh, especially, again, in a domain that we utterly dominate. And if it does get down to hardball, and it did in the Soviet case, you know, we did not back down. We went with import controls, and the companies that, that violated our sanctions, you know, paid the price. They're gone. So, in other words, if you really want to play hardball with a place like the United States, we actually know how to do that. And we will win. There's no question about it. Because those economies are very fragile. I mean, Moscow goes without saying. But if you knew how close to the edge the Chinese are, I mean, those guys have their, anything under 7% growth, they're in their own sort of slow motion economic implosion because their overhead's so high. And they have big problems and they are sweating it. And they can institute market reforms because the growth rate would slow further and it would jeopardize Communist Party rule. So, in other words, these guys aren't feeling like real winners behind closed doors. They're nervous as cats, I think. And if they're not, they're brain dead. They should be. Yes, any others? I have so many questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, uh, USA has something like 16 intelligence agencies. Why do they... Uh, Well, I mean, it's a matter of, re of, of priorities. It's a matter of resourcing. I mean, for example, why hasn't, the, why hasn't the intelligence community picked up on the idea that information is the coin of the realm in the markets? If you were to apply intelligence assets, for example, to find out what provinces were in China underestimating their non-performing loans and, under, and deliberately to the central government, uh, under-reporting under the vacancies in their real estate, you know, the ghost, the ghost cities and all of that, uh, and they're lying to the central government because if they don't, they're going to be penalized, which is, a, this is all true, but we could be collecting and basically letting the market know that China is vastly underestimating its non-performing loans and the scale of its real estate bubble, just for example. Uh, I'll tell you that I don't think that 500 billion to 600 billion of the reserves are there. They say they have 3 trillion, sorry, 3 trillion in reserves. We think they're lying. We think they have 2.5 and falling. Now, if the markets knew that, I mean, we can find that out. That's, that's learnable. But are we looking? I don't know. I, I, I worry. I don't think we are. But if the markets knew that, whoa, right? They wouldn't feel so good about that mountain of cash that has prevented them from actually performing due diligence. They don't perform due diligence because they see all those reserves and therefore, they don't have to have disclosure, transparency, corporate governance, reliable statistics, rule of law. They don't have to play by market rules because the markets just care about, well, do they have enough cash to, to service me? It's sort of this après moi le déluge mindset. You know, I don't care. It's, I'm not a long haul player. Am I going to get my loan back? Am I going to get my deal done? Am I going to get my bonus? That's where we really are. Who are we kidding? So we're not tasking the intelligence community, in my opinion, in the economic and financial domain, the war fighting domain. No. And we have the resources, but that information is ending up on the cutting room floor, in my opinion. Yes. The assets uh, or the footprint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrew, do we, can we do that quickly? Throw up gas problem? I mean, they're, 
there have been rumors that they have considered sending pipelines under the sea to Europe to try to get their dependency off of Russia, but I don't see that. No, I mean, I think it's the, uh, we're, we're making some progress. I mean, it's a, the North Stream is seeking to set back, but the third energy package is a real thing, and it, it obviously did kill South Stream. We just have to make sure it's not replaced by Turk Stream and, or resurrected itself. Uh, but the interconnectors combined with the LNG terminals in places like Lithuania and Poland are going to ultimately succeed in weaning us off of Russian gas. I mean, they are in trouble over time. They are fighting a losing battle to maintain their dominance and stranglehold over Central and Eastern Europe, not to mention Western Europe. Well, I mean, you know, Qatar is the largest gas producer or one of the top two. Uh, it might still be Russia itself. But the long and short of it is the U.S. is going to be a player in sending LNG over here. And that, that's only going to be an upward trajectory. Now, the U.S. alone is not going to be the solution. But LNG terminals, in effect, and, and the interconnectors, and I'd be interested in other opinions on this, but I think that really is the answer. Plus, stopping efforts like Nord Stream 2 to negate uh, the progress that's been made over the past decade. I mean, we're working hard. I mean, those of us who care about freedom in Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, are working hard to make sure that the diversification away from Moscow is accelerated. I think they will try. I think that, for example, if I were in Lithuania at Klapedia and the LNG floating facility there, you know, I'd be worried about sabotage. I'd be worried about cyber attacks. I'd be worried about efforts to disrupt that, uh, that arrangement. Uh, if I were the Poles, I would have similar concerns. In other words, the Russians do react when they see escape routes being successfully configured in the energy and other inordinate dependency categories. They do react. Look at the Norbalt cable between Sweden and Lithuania. They did move their naval forces to interdict the, 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 that, that line on four separate occasions uh, you know, in, in the spring of a year ago. We predicted that they would before they did, and God love them, they did precisely that. Now mind you, they didn't stop Norbald, but they were trying to send a military signal. This is why we're seeing the harassing in the game that we're playing, the simulation we're playing, of Romanian drilling operations in their exclusive economic zone in the Black Sea is because they don't want Romania to become an exporter of oil. They don't want them to become independent themselves. So anytime Moscow sees their grass being wrested away, like the Inkelans gas storage facility in Latvia, our next speaker coming up, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they react. So when we're talking to the military, we're identifying these as economic and financial flashpoints that could in fact translate into military operations. Now, with that, uh, did we ever get gas from up there? Yeah, so sometimes the companies that have commodity flows, I mean, it doesn't visualize quite, there would be, you kind of would need to customize the visualization a little bit to understand, you know, how much money over what time. Is this a historic transaction? Is it currently active? Is it something that's going into the future? And with commodity flows and wire transfers are a little bit trickier to put on a map. So, I, you know, and uh, gas problems also, you know, many of these, it depends how much of Gazprom do you want to see. So they've got a subsidiary, subsidiary that's in the space business. Yeah. So some of these transactions you see in various parts of the world, you might not expect them. It's because it's Gazprom space systems that's signing whatever deal. But this is a this is a look at the active transactions of Gazprom. 
my value. So with that, um, I want to apologize to Yanish, who's on his way up in the sense that we got a little bit of a late start, but you're going to get your time back on the back end. Uh, hopefully you can stay. But um, that's it for the economic and financial piece. Thank you for this.